There's a political power play on in Sri Lanka. Under pressure at home and abroad, the president, Metripala Sirisena, earlier telling diplomats that he'd moved up to next Monday, the date for parliament to confirm his shock sacking of Prime Minister Ranil Rikwemwesinghe and his replacement by longtime strongman Mahinda Rajapaksa. The head of the, his party uh, reversing the change in that calendar, but that's been since denied. There's confusion, which means uh, Sri Lanka continues to have dueling prime ministers. We're going to look into the cause and the legality of the recall. Outside players watching closely, in particular China, which was close to Rajapaksa during his decade in power. That special relationship, which included big loans to Sri Lanka, raised the hackles of an India that's wary of encirclement by its regional ri ri rival. More fundamentally, it's a real test for Sri Lanka's democracy. It was on Rajapaksa's watch that a civil war ended with the effective crushing of Tamil Tiger rebels in the north. Reconciliation has been at best slow and timid. Could the turmoil in Colombo reopen wounds that are still raw? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at the showdown in Sri Lanka. And joining us from Colombo, Rear Admiral Amon Wijewik Rama, former governor of Eastern Province. Thank you for being with us in the France 24 debate. Also joining us from Washington, Bharat Gopal Aswani, director of the Atlantic Council's South Asia Center. Here in the studio, we're joined by Dylan Madhavan of the Paris-based Center for Studies on India and South Asia. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, the France 24 debate on Facebook and on Twitter, hashtag F24debate. Is the president backing down after uh, pushing back the convening of parliament to the 16th? The date moved up to next Monday. Then the French news agency quoted a senior official inside of uh, the president's party as saying, no, in fact, uh, the date of the 16th still stands. And now we're getting contradictory word from uh, the prime minister-elect, quoted by the Associated Press. Uh, maybe you can help us, uh, Mohan uh, Wijirik Rama, to clear this up. Uh, when is parliament convening, you think? I think as it is now, uh, parliament will convene on the 16th of uh, November, as originally prorogued, and there is no change to that. Even though we had those remarks uh, by the president to diplomats, and according again, according uh, to uh, the uh, prime minister, um, that uh, he has uh, decided to summon the par parliament on the 5th now, in fact. No, I think he has been misquoted because uh, it was at a time of a uh, uh, meeting where he was told over the phone that there's a possibility that uh, it will be advanced to fifth, but uh, that was not confirmed, neither gazetted. Because if you are going to uh, re-summon the parliament after proving it, you have to make a proclamation, and there's no proclamation which has been done yet. Is this legal? Uh, there was a change in the constitution in 2015. Can the president just sack the prime minister and replace him with someone else? Yes, it's absolutely legal because uh, when uh, the president and the prime minister jointly formed a national government after January 2015, uh, after the loss of uh, Prime Minister Rajapaksa, they continued as a national government after the general elections. And uh, when, as per the constitution, I can give you all the articles, when one party relinquishes it or pulls out, automatic cabinet get dissolved and uh, as per the regulations article uh, 48 1 when the cabinet get dissolved the prime minister automatically get dislodged all right let, let me cross to london and uh, alan keenan who's uh, the sri lanka project director at uh, crisis group thank you for joining us here in the france 24 debate um, we, we just heard there uh, uh, Mohan uh, Wijewik Rama saying that for him, this is legal, the, the sacking of the PM and his replacement. Do you agree? 
Well, I just came in a bit late. I didn't. I just heard the tail end of his argument, but I did hear the simple answer is no. Uh, I did hear him say that would make this claim that Sarasena made initially that once um, one part of a national government pulls out, that the cabinet of ministers is automatically dissolved, and with that the PM's the prime minister's seat is vacant. That is that's an argument that few others than those closely aligned with Sarasena I think has any. Um, any basis in the Constitution. And there have been multiple um, essays written in the last week, you know, voluminously debunking this. Now, I'm not a constitutional lawyer, but the, uh, the, the case that this is unconstitutional, I think, is overwhelming to any objective observer. What's it all about? Well, I mean, it's about power. It's about Sarasena's desire to... Um, you know, he didn't think he was going to, he had any way, his term expires in a year. He didn't see any way, uh, any likelihood of his continuing in power beyond next year if he had continued with the national government. Um, it's, uh, Mahinda Rajapaksa has been eager to get into back into power as quickly as possible. I think partly because he's like any politician, he wants to be in power, but also I think he was worried about some of the corruption cases that were percolating slowly, but they were getting through the court system. And he was worried maybe in next year something would come of those. Um, and I think it's also about, as Sirisena has um, has himself articulated, it's about deep disagreements, cultural, um, psychological, political, economic, uh, between him and and the prime minister, Rano Vikramasinghe. And I think there, both sides really completely misplayed their hand. And, um, you know, there's mistakes on both sides. So I think Rano Vikramasinghe and the UNP are probably close to 50% responsible for this um, for this crisis, although Sirisena was the one who, so to speak, pulled the trigger. That's 50% responsible. Delon Madhavan, what, what is the disagreement about? What, what, what is the, 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 the disagreement about over policy, over people? Uh, there is... Uh, most of the people in Sri Lanka are quite upset about uh, what happened because it's seen by most of the civil society members... Uh, of course, uh, partisans of uh, Vikram Singer, but also academics, as a constitutional coup, uh, mainly to protect the interest of uh, Siri Sena. The knows? president claims that there was an assassination attempt against him. Yeah, but this plot is not really clear. So he, he seems to criticize one member of the cabinet, but there is no, not really any, any proof. And even if you add this... Uh, issue it should be solved uh, in a trial in a court not uh, by uh, sacking the prime minister so it's it's not really clear and the idea is also uh, uh, you have different scale of interpretation and the role of china and india economically is very important too i think we're going to get back to the role of outside players later uh, bharat uh, gobalaswamy your thoughts on uh, what this constitutional crisis is really all about. Um, I think my colleague from London um, summarized some of these things uh, eloquently. I think, first of all, I also, I'm not a constitutional lawyer nor a constitutional expert per se, but whatever I've read and interpreted and understood um, as per the constitutional amendment uh, of, yeah. cons constitutional amendment of nine, the 19th constitutional amendment, I think this is illegal. And I also believe, and in my interpretation, my understanding is the speaker has the right to dissolve the parliament or, um, you know, um, 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 dismiss the prime minister, not the president per se. And I think this was uh, designed in such a way in, uh, so that to uphold the integrity of the democra democratic process. Now, coming to where this, the motivation of this crisis is, I understand that um, the Sirisena Ranil Wickremesinghe government has has suffered a popularity decline. It's been hugely unpopular. It has failed to implement on the reforms that it had promised for people. There was, and Mahinda Rajapaksa, as witnessed, was gaining in popularity um, as in the recent council elections, um, in the local elections. So all this put together, Sirisena, like any other politician, saw the writing on the wall. Uh, it was a smart, cap, uh, calculated political move to join forces and get back uh, to retain his power, uh, th this was one option where he could just go back to Rajapaksa, forge a coalition, and keep keep him himself. Were in you power surprised, Ranil? Were you surprised? Um, 
I'm surprised. I, I knew something along these lines were co uh, coming, but I was surprised at the scale and the magnitude and the style in something this was done. But, you know, f witnessing politics across subcontinent, I suspect one should never be surprised at such developments. But, but, I, but, but all that said and done, I think Sri Lanka is... Sri Lanka is a credit of one of the oldest democracies in Asia, and I think it's a little bit disappointing to see things go this way. A uh, little bit uh, disappointing, you say. Of course, we're going to see how it plays out when Parliament eventually uh, does reconvene. I want to get back to that point. Uh, Mohan Wijewik Rama, why not reconvene Parliament next week? You will understand that... Uh the marriage between Sirisena and uh, Ranik Vikramasinghe at the start was to oust Rajapaksas from political uh, speech. And that was the main reason for their uh, getting together. But their policies never, you know, uh, resonated. And uh, that was the main reason during the last three and a half years, there were a lot of conflicts between the Prime Minister and the President. Now, to get back to your point, the... Uh, I mean, when a new government is formed, new prime minister is appointed, I mean, they are not going to pursue the same policies of the previous government. Ministers have to be appointed, they have to be given their task, new budget is around the corner, that has to be prepared. So, there's a lot of things which needs to be done before the parliament assembles. So, that is the main reason why the parliament has been prorogued for 16 to, or 3 weeks which is absolutely legal because the constitution says that the president can prorogue it up to a uh, time of two months, but he has prorogued it only for three weeks. If he wants, he can advance it by another proclamation. I mean, it all depends whether he can get everything in order, get the budget all prepared uh, so that when the parliament assembles that he can go on with the normal work of the parliament. Because cynics, let me let me just interrupt you here. Uh, the cynics are saying that uh, the reason uh, he refuses to uh, he uh, to uh, recall Parliament sooner rather than later, or had refused, uh, was uh, because he wanted to win over as many lawmakers as possible that are caught in the middle to have an extra week of lobbying. Your 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 reaction to that claim? Yeah, I mean, uh, that is the general uh, talk by the opposition, but that is not exactly the situation because the situation by Mahindra Rajapaksa and the uh, government has been that they have to get the budget prepared. And budget is the most important thing because by December, it has to be approved so that the country to go forward. So budget was the main criteria to get this extended. Alan Keenan, your thoughts? Well, you might see from my face that I'm a wee bit skeptical about that argument. I mean, uh, I'm sure the UNP, I know the UNP was already working on uh, on their budget. So, I mean, if it's a question of the budget, you know, uh, they'd be happy to help out there. Um, it's not about the budget. It's not about the need for ministers to get up to speed on their, you know, their various portfolios. It's about buying more time so that um, Roger Pox and Sarasena can woo enough people over uh, to their side. And when they feel confident that they've got the 113 they need, um, then, you know, then the, the button will be pushed and a few days later, parliament will be called into session. Um, I think that's what everybody knows in Sri Lanka. Um, and, you know, of course, uh, Ranil Vikramasinghe and the UNP are also trying to woo their people and try to win over anyone from Sarasen and Rajapaksa's side. So, you know, the tradition in Sri Lanka of of um, buying politicians, buying and the votes of MPs, um, you know, is longstanding as it is in other countries sometimes. So uh, everyone knows what's happening, and there's absolutely no reason why uh, why the why Parliament had to be pro prorogued in the first place. Of course, it's true it was in the right the constitutional rights of um, Sarah Sainte to do so. So no one, I don't think, is challenging his right to have prorogued the parliament. It's more about the sort of the morality or the ethics of doing so uh, that, that, that's in question. Dylan Madhavan? I quite agree with Alain, actually. It's really a, a question to gain time because time is playing, I think, for Sarah Sena and uh, Rajapakse. Can Sarah Sena win his bet? Sorry? Can Sirisina win his bet and have Raja Paksa as yeah, his prime minister? Yeah, because there is this tradition also to try to buy the supports of some uh, 
uh, some uh, deputy, some uh, member of parliament. And even if we recall history in 2015 or uh, 14, it was a surprise to see uh, Sirisena leave uh, Rajapaksa government and join actually uh, Ranil Vikramasinghe to to join. So are you saying alliances? Uh, come together and get undone purely for mercantile reasons? Uh, for some, uh, it's, unfortunately, it's, yes. It's not a very um, positive view of Sri Lanka's democracy. Uh, I think it can happen in uh, many democracy, but uh, history of, his, uh, of Sri Lanka is like this. We just have to read the records or uh, historians' uh, books to see that, unfortunately, that often happened in Sri Lanka. Bharat Gobalaswamy, you agree? Uh, you see, um, you know, I have a, again, with my colleague in London, I want to echo a couple of points. If your priority is to prepare the budget, think of my, myself in an organization where a budget meeting is coming up. And the last thing that I want to fire is a key member of my team before the budget meeting is coming up and prepare, prepare why precipitate, shoot myself in the foot by precipitating a crisis. So I think I disagree with the argument that, you know, this was this is the time for the budget and all that stuff. The other thing is also the, the, the horse trading or buying cash for, you know, giving yourself enough time uh, to buy those MPs to sway on your side. We've seen news reports, however speculative they may be, um, you know, that theory should not be dismissed about potential Chinese cash doing the rounds to buy those MPs. And, you know, it's, it's curious that the Chinese ambassador um, has, you know, gone and visited Rajapaksa and congratulated him. So when a, const- when a crisis like this is unfolding, how do you have the uh, the ambassador of a foreign country going and congratulating? Yeah, in the past days, China's embassy in Sri Lanka putting out a statement to deny rumors it had paid lawmakers to endorse the ouster of uh, Prime Minister uh, Wikram Wasinga uh, in its uh, statement, uh, the, the saying such allegations are groundless and uh, irresponsible. Uh, how do you respond, uh, uh, Mohan uh, Wijewakrama, to these uh, uh, allegations that the Chinese might somehow be meddling? So I think it has been denied by the Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister himself, Mr. Ranil Vikramasinghe, was uh, yesterday by some uh, foreign uh, journalist, and uh, he categorically said that there's no Chinese involvement, so that we had to just write it off. And I must tell you that uh, if anything is not legal, that is the removal of the Prime Minister, appointment of the Prime Minister, proroguing, we have a Supreme Court in Sri Lanka. And uh, that is the place where people go for redress, I mean, to seek your legal remedies. Ronald Victor said that neither his party has ever approached the Supreme Court. Now, this happened last Friday. Now, today is uh, Wednesday here. So, last Friday, they have not attempted to even seek the Supreme Court. Uh, Opinion on this. So what I feel is that it is the wrong message that has been promulgated by certain Western people. I must tell you, when the parliament assembles, there is nothing called confidence vote. The parliament, if the parliament feels that there is a no confidence against the prime minister who has been duly appointed, you have to bring a no confidence vote against him. Right, and so that the, is a procedure where the MP is signed and it has been handed over, it has to be the party leaders, debated, and the vote taken. And we'll say, for instance, Mahindra Rajapaksa loses that vote, it is not a confidence vote for Ranil Vikram Singh, because the president can again appoint a prime minister who may feel enjoys the support of the parliament. That is the constitution. So you must understand the legal aspect. All right, and we're gonna we're gonna pick up on those legal aspects, and we're also gonna pick up. I'm sorry to interrupt. We have to take a very quick break. We're gonna pick up on those legal aspects and the role of China. When we come back, you're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. We're watching the constitutional crisis that's unfolding in uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, joining us to talk about it from Colombo, Mohan Wijewik Rama, former governor of Eastern Province, uh, who is with us. Welcome back as well uh, from Washington, D.C., Bharat Gopalaswamy, director of the Atlantic Council's South Asia Center from London. We're in the company of Alan Keenan. Sri Lanka Project Director at Crisis Group, and here in the studio, Delon Madhavan, geographer and uh, a research associate at the Center for Studies on India and South Asia. 
Yeah, the uh, uh, the uh, country uh, divided and on tender hooks. Uh, this we saw one protester killed over the weekend after that surprise sacking of the PM, and there have been big protests like the ones that took place in the capital on Tuesday. President violated my civic right. He violated my constitution. He he did something so unbecoming of us. We are not fools. I don't want him to insult my intelligence. The, the trust has been betrayed. The trust that we placed in the government has been betrayed. The people that we elected to be a voice in parliament has no uh, voice now. And as we were saying in part one of our discussion, uh, uh, among the things that are weighing uh, on this crisis are the role of regional players. Now, back in 2014, when Raja Paksa was president, Chinese, uh, his Chinese counterpart, Xi Jinping, visited for the launch uh, of a Chinese-funded $1.4 billion port city. Uh, there is Hambantota port located at the southern tip of Sri Lanka, uh, Hambantota, which happens to be uh, Raja Paksa's uh, home uh, district. Uh, I want to get back to what you were talking about, Delon Madhavan, in part one of our discussion about the outsized role of China. Are we fixating too much on China and on these big projects like that one? Uh, yeah, but what is interesting also, it's just one week before actually the beginning of this crisis, Vic Vikram Singh was in uh, New Delhi with Modi actually, and he withdrew um, a, a, um, a project which was given to China to give it in a joint venture with uh, India and Sri Lanka. So I think all these considerations are so important because clearly Vikramasinghe seems uh, closer to India, whereas uh, Rajapaksa really seems close to China. And uh, with all this uh, trap economy, uh, debt uh, policy, etc., there is uh, also a, a fear of it. So is it a case of India supports one side and China supports the other? Uh, it seems clear, I think, that for India it's better to not have uh, uh, Rajapaksa and his allies in Colombo. Uh, Bharat Gopalaswamy, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, which is corresponding to a pattern we've seen in other places like Malaysia, like the Maldives, of a blowback against China. Yeah, I mean, I you know I think I think the um, there is a broader trend out here. You mentioned Malaysia, you mentioned Maldives. Um, there is the China Pakistan economic corridor. Um, so you know uh, the, the the reality is China has China has been engaged in what Secretary Tillerson put it as predatory economics and also coercive lending, lending practices and uh, traps most of these countries in a debt trap. And, and, and you know, Sri Lanka is, is, uh, is part of that debt trap. And I think um, the po policymakers in Delhi and Washington are very wary about this. They are very concerned about this. And I think, um, you know, our, the, our, uh, the United States' administration's policy vis-a-vis -vis China um, uh, the reality is we are yet to come up with a viable alternative to offer to Sri Lanka in terms of development financing that, that, uh, that, that provides a suitable alternative to Sri Lanka. And unless and until uh, policymakers in Washington are able to offer that suitable alternative, you're going to have these kinds of incidents happening across Maldives or Sri Lanka or any other islands that China can get its hold on. Yeah, the, the case particu in particular of the Hambantota port uh, is is raising eyebrows because, well, the port has not so far um, met its promise. Uh, some are calling it one of the world's biggest white elephants. Is that exaggerated? No, I don't think that's exaggerated. I think the numbers are there to see. And, I, you know, and there is a, there is a, of course, and there is a pattern to um, China's uh, projects across, even in the um, uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor, there are a number of these white elephant projects. Um, in Africa, you've seen some of these white elephant projects. So I don't think that it's exaggerated. You see, the bigger point here is also many of these financing by China are um, they lack transparency, there are quality control issues, 
Um, the, the scrutiny about them in the parliament is not so strict. And overall, even China's numbers themselves are uh, um, uh, suffer lack of transparency issues. So when you have, this is why you're called a white elephant projects. And it, it behooves upon China to come up with more um, um, transpar uh, transparency in their lending uh, practices, the numbers and what the results these projects kind of yield um, that support what their objectives are. And then, and uh, most of them have, uh, beyond their economic angle, they have a security angle. Why pick projects like these that are uh, security and strategic concerns to the neighboring nations, if you're serious about building up a nation? It makes sense, though, to build a port in Sri Lanka if you have big tankers that are uh, going uh, from the Far East uh, towards Africa. Yeah, no, I, I agree. But it's also a strategic, you know, the 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 the, the thing with the Hum and Toda, it's a, there is a duality nature to this, right? There is not only an economic uh, sense to this, but there is a duality nature. And if you look at China's projects across the Indian Ocean, they all have a duality nature to something like this. Uh, Mohan Wichiwik Rama, uh, in the uh, five-year period when uh, Rajapaksa was still president from 2010 to 2015, Sri Lanka's debt tripled uh, in size proportional uh, to, to GDP. Do you feel as though Sri Lanka got had by China? Uh, first of all, I must just do some clarification on those figures. The Chinese uh, loans amount to only 10% of our overall debt. And that has been uh, very, very uh, announced. It, Chinese themselves have come up and said that your loan only 10% of your total loans. So we don't have a Chinese debt drop in Sri Lanka, number one. Number two, we just discussed about Moody, uh, Prime Minister Moody of India. I mean, President Mahindra Rajapaksa also visited him recently and they had a very cordial discussion. I mean, whatever the reservations they had, I think is all gone now because he always have been telling that the Indians are my relations and our, all others are friends. I mean, we have been always teaching, uh, treating Indians as relations. And do you know that Hamad report was never given to Chinese by Mahindra Rajapaksa, but it was given to uh, Chinese by Ranil Vikramasinghe. And even this uh, 50,000 houses, which came as a result of Indian uh, grant, was given to a Chinese contractor by Ranil Vikramasinghe, and he was admonished and told to give it to Indians. So, if you look at Rajapaksa and Ranil Vikramasinghe, although that you are trying to portray that Mahindra Rajapaksa is anti-Indian, he's not. I mean, he is Sri Lankan. He loves Sri Lanka. And why Hammandada port was uh, located there? Because we saw Sri Lanka's only advantage is our geography, and we must take advantage of geography, shipping, air, and whatnot, which is connected to geography. There are hundred thousands of ships which pass us every year. Singapore attracts hundred thousand ships, and we have been attracting only hundred thousand ships, and Hamadar port was never completed. By the time uh, the regime changed from Rajapaksa to Ranil Vikram Singha, only the, uh, what you call the part one, the first uh, part was completed. Even the cranes are not installed. So how can a port bring you revenue when it is not completed? But given the chance, if you can renegotiate it, get it back, I don't know, we will run it and it will be one of the ports which will bring a lot of revenue to Sri Lanka. Hindsight being 2020, Alan Keenan, uh, what's your Hello. takeaway on the Hambantola port project? Well, I mean, one interesting fact is that it was initially offered to India um, by Rajapaksa himself, and they they didn't see it um, as a as a money maker. Uh, so then they went to uh, China, which probably didn't see it as a money maker either, but saw that it would um, give them leverage. And you know, some people think they have military uh, intentions. I'm not. I'm not sure. No one knows. But certainly they saw that even if they lost money on it, um, it might come back to to benefit them. And I think um, uh, my colleague in Washington's um, uh, point, I think, is, um, you know, is uh, is useful that the, the U.S. and the West more generally hasn't figured out a way to compete with China's, um, you know, big, um, with, you know, they they have all this cash and they can uh, do a lot with the cash. And um and uh, the U.S. prefers to build, um, you know, uh, warships and new nuclear missiles. And maybe some of that money might be better used uh, helping out countries like Sri Lanka. But in any case, I think it's not a simple China on Rajapaksa's side, India on um, on Vikramasinghe's side. I think that's it, it's a, it's important not to see it as too black and white. 
In fact, China, uh, sorry, in fact, India has been cultivating um, ties again with uh, with Rajapaksa, partly, you know, to hedge their bets. Um, so they, you know, they think, well, this government, I, a few weeks ago, they'd say this government, the UNP coalition with Sirisane is not doing too well. Rajapaksa and his people are coming back. They're much more popular. They're likely to win the next election. So we've got to be friends with with Rajapaksa if he's going to be in power again. So, you know, in other countries, I'm sure, are hedging their bets as well. India, and, you know, let, even let, let, under let me both just, these, the way I think... I just wanted to ask you, Alan Keenan, because uh, just to explain for our viewers, yeah. India wary of China uh, and, and what's called encirclement, because China does have growing influence in cash-strapped Pakistan, as well as influence in Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal. We can show it on, on the map here. Would you say today, uh, Alan Keenan, that uh, in India there's more of an obsession with China than with Pakistan? Well, I'm not an Indian pol uh, expert in Indian politics, but um, but certainly those concerns are very real. They you know they're across the political spectrum in India, uh, so that that's um, that's real. I mean, my view is that if you look at Sri Lanka, I think countries like India, India in particular, but other countries would actually have more influence. If they followed, uh, you know, if they were really uh, deep and principled supporters of of democratic politics and of you know constitutional and rule of law issues, and I think that would be true of the United States. I think the, you know, if countries like the United States, India, et cetera, um, play on the same kind of pure power um, uh, uh, sort of um, principles or or lack of principles of that China does, they're going to lose. Um, but if they, you know, if they if they want to uh, sort of weaken the ability or sort of temper the ability of China to, to gain influence around the world and including in places like uh, Sri Lanka. I think they'd be better to be consistent defenders of, of, uh, of democracy and, and liberal values. And I don't think they have been so clearly um, as, they, as they could have been. Bharat Kopalaswani, uh, that brings us back to the current crisis at hand. How do you think India and the United States are going to be reacting? Yeah, and, um, you know, I, and I also want to take the opportunity to second both my uh, colleagues' point in Colombo as well as in um, London. I don't think it's it's as black and white as in India, China, or a United States vying for influence here. The picture in Asia Pacific or Indo Pacific or however you want to term the geography is much more complicated. For example, even India, for that matter, has a has a very robust trade relationship with China of around eighty to ninety billion dollars. You know, so there is a um, all these countries have an equation amongst themselves, have a relationship with China, and they see China as the locomotive for their future growth. But at the same time, they've always seen, um, looked up to the United States as a guarantor of stability on the security terms. Um, so the American presence and the American stability in that region has always been that constant factor. And now what's happening in the last 10 years, as we witnessed uh, with the Obama administration's rebalance or pivot to Asia or whatever might, you, you might have, um, whatever was there, and with the Secretary Tillerson laying out that speech on Indo-Pacific and the United States pursuing a policy of Indo-Pacific, um, what's aggravated the situation is the current political crisis in Washington itself, the whole America first thing and the America, um, the what, what does America first actually mean? America first does actually mean America alone. Um, so all these, uh, all these uh, mixed policy signals, the president's Twitter uh, foreign policy has caused this flutter and alarm about where America actually stands. And I think that's where you've had um, an opportunity where China has pushed the status quo in many of these countries and watched and waited for the regional parties or the United States to respond. And when it has been unable to respond or when it has not been able to um, uh, not respond at all, uh, China has taken those chances. So I think that's where the United States currently stands. I think the cutting of USAID funding was a bad signal sent to Sri Lanka. Um, the United States has pressed on the human rights and the reconciliation efforts. I think that's a great move, but that is the only foot in which the United States led. That coupled with a viable development alternative, financing op, um, initiatives, a mutual U.S.-Sri Lanka bilateral relations, all these should be positive foreign policy steps that the United States administration should have. Very recently, we have Ambassador Alana Teplitz, who has taken charge in Sri Lanka, and I'm hopeful that you know um, she will be able to fulfill all this vision and implement all these foreign policy objectives that we have. It's not just India and the United States paying close attention to what's happening in Sri Lanka. 
I want to turn to the geographer in the room here. Uh, Devin, at the end of September, we saw Japan uh, send its, uh, its biggest warship, the Kaga helicopter, helicopter carrier, uh, into Sri Lanka's Colombo Harbor. There were joint exercises. What did you make of that? Oh, to tell the truth, I don't have any uh, idea about it, actually. But tell me about the strategic importance of Sri Lanka. Uh, actually, it's uh, in the main road of uh, commerce, actually, uh, maritime commerce. So it's a uh, strategic uh, place. Uh, so I think for Japan, it's interesting to, to, to have uh, exchanges with Sri Lanka and uh, um, practice uh, training with them to also consolidate, so consolidate their, uh, their uh, monitoring on this uh, particular region. Mohan uh, Widjewik Rama, uh, Rear Admiral Widjewik Rama, are, were you surprised to see a, a Japanese vessel uh, f- t- coming over for military exercises? No, I, I think uh, right along from our independence, we have been having exercises from with many countries. And uh, yes, this is the first time I think uh, a large ship took part in the exercise. But, I mean, uh, friendly navies do exercises. We go to various other countries, our ships go. And that doesn't mean that, you know, our policies have changed. We are basically non-aligned. We, uh, I mean, are friendly with all the countries. We don't take sides. And, uh, I mean, uh, any ship, whether it is China, India, Japan, Russia, UK, US, any ship can come and berth in our harbors for logistics and uh, crew changes and so on and even exercises. I want to ask you as well, uh, uh, Mahinda Rajapaksa, when he was president, it was uh, the period when there was the end of the civil war, which there was the crushing of the Tamil Tiger Rebellion in the north uh, with uh, an estimated 40,000 killed. There's been a process of reconciliation. Human rights activists say it's been timid, the fear is if he returns back as prime minister, will that be the end of any type of uh, truth and reconciliation process? No, not at all. I think uh, Sri Lanka has initiated its own mechanism for uh, taking action against people who have, uh, you know, had war crimes. But this 40,000 thing is a bit of a fallacy because you can't hide 40,000 uh, skeletons in Jaffna. And they are, I mean, we have not got 40,000 names of the people who have got killed. I mean, even Lord Nesby, I mean, from UK, categorically said, I've been going through various messages which have been going up and down with the British High Commission and US Embassy, that the maximum amount of casualties, including LTT, cannot be anything more than 8,000. So this 40,000 thing is... I think it's all wrong, and we were very unfortunate for Anil Vikram Singh's government to readily go and accept that there had been 40,000 uh, deaths, because there's absolutely no proof. I mean, uh, how can you hide 40,000? You can't even hide 40,000, 400, I mean, uh, uh, you know, 4,000 bodies in, uh, who had got killed. So there's not a single trace, no skeletons. I mean, from satellite, you can find out whether there are uh, right. people who have died of that magnitude. So it is a lie. And uh, we'll have to certainly take it up with uh, whatever the countries in time to come with the next government to resolve that. Uh, Alan Keenan, the prospects for long-term reconciliation, if if uh, uh, Mahinda Rajapaksa is confirmed as prime minister, what are they? In a word, bleak. Um, I mean, I think even this government, which may now no longer be there, the sort of Ranil Sirisena alliance, you know, they said they wanted to address these issues. They said they wanted to reorient the state in more inclusive ways. They said they wanted to deal with the legacy of the war. Uh, but it was it was quite um, lackluster. I mean, there were some in the administration who were trying their best and some I have a lot of respect for. But there were not the strong, concise, uh, concerted, clear messages from either the prime minister, Ronald Vikramasinghe, or the president 
saying Sri Lanka has to shift from being a pr principally single Buddhist country, as enshrined in its constitution, to a, to a pluralist country in which Tamils and Muslims are full and equal citizens. That hasn't happened. There's been no work real, really done uh, uh, consistently along those lines. And I think with Rajapaksa, there will absolutely be none of that work. So. Um, so it's it's quite it's quite um, disappointing that this real window of opportunity that we've had the last three years has not really been been made use of. And one last I mean one last thing I'd like to add in in the time we have is you know it's not just about past um, issues, past violence, past deaths, but there's real worries that um, many activists, Tamil activists in the in northern and eastern provinces, but also Muslims and Sinhalese um, lawyers, journalists who have taken risks, who have challenged the Rajapaksa who have investigated or called for the investigation of cases that, it, that possibly implicate the Rajapaksa family. Um, those guys are all going to be at risk. They're, they're, they're increasing worries about their, you know, their risk to arrest, to intimidation, or, or possibly to physical violence. So I think the international community has to keep its eye on that um, issue uh, with, um, you know, very closely. Dylan Madhavan? Yeah, I'm quite worried for uh, the problem of issue of uh, accountability. Uh, one of the op when uh, this uh, Syrian and Savi Kremesing uh, government was elected was they will try to set up some trial and give justice. Uh, I think minorities and uh, civil societies uh, are quite disappointed by the results. And of course, if uh, uh, Rajabaksa uh, come back to the power, it's clearly sure that nothing will happen again. And uh, the other problem is really the security of the civil, so civil uh, society members and minorities, actually. Uh, you had, uh, for, for the past years, uh, a lot of violence against Muslim people. Uh, so what will happen? And the thing is, when uh, uh, Rajapaksa uh, was set uh, in power again as prime minister, the first move was to attack the media, actually, uh, run by the government. So. We're going we're gonna to talk about that in our Media Watch segment. I, I want to thank you, Adelon Medavan. I want to thank Mohan Wijewikrama for being with us uh, from Colombo. I also want to thank Alan Keenan in London and uh, Bharat Gopalaswani for being with us from Washington.